I'm going to tell you a story. It's a sad story. It's a complicated story. It's the kind of story that pits two people against each other and has the capacity to pit us against each other, too. And it's the kind of story you've heard a lot the last couple of years. So I'd like you to imagine two people, Jack and Mary. Jack is a software developer and an entrepreneur. And in 2003, he started his own software company, which is now an international phenomenon. Mary is a software engineer, and she just started in her first leadership role at Jack's company. Now, the story of Jack and Mary, as Jack tells it, is this. A month ago, Mary started working at his company. She was bright, capable, and attractive. And immediately, there was chemistry between them. They would flirt when they were talking. They would sit next to each other at meetings. They would stand next to each other when they were working. Mary would drop by Jack's office for no reason. Jack would drop by Mary's for no reason. And then a week ago, they went away on a business trip. And of course, the inevitable happened. They went out, they had a couple of drinks, they went back to Jack's room, and they had sex. Now, Despite what this story sounds like, Jack would like you to know that he's a good guy, he's married, and so he told Mary that while he'd had a wonderful time, from now on their relationship was going to have to be strictly professional. Mary's version of the story is quite different. Mary started working at Jack's company a month ago, excited about having her first leadership role in this field. But right away, Jack started flirting with her. She'd try and change the subject, he would make fun of her. He would sit next to her at every meeting. He would stand right next to her when they were working. And he would sometimes drop by her office for no reason at all. Mary was worried about what her staff was going to be saying about her relationship with Jack. A week ago, they went away on a business trip together. They went out for dinner, they had a couple of drinks, and the next thing Mary remembers, she's in Jack's room, she's clearly just had sex, and she has no idea how she got there. Mary's scared, and she doesn't know what to do. Now, in this envelope, conveniently labeled truth, is the true story of Jack and Mary. In this envelope, it will tell you whether Jack is a rapist, whether he used a date rape drug to get Mary back to his room, it will tell you whether Mary's lying, hurt by Jack ending her, the relationship before it had even begun, trying to get back at him for what he did. Or it might tell you that the truth is somewhere in the middle, that both Jack's version and Mary's version have some accuracy to them. But here's the thing. You don't get to look in the envelope. So what are you going to do? You've been told the story of Jack and Mary. How are you going to respond to it? Well, if you're the legal system, you have an answer to that question. If Jack is charged with a criminal offense, you're going to give him a presumption of innocence. You're going to require that his guilt be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. He'll have a right to silence. He won't have to testify. Mary will have to testify, and her credibility will be vigorously challenged by Jack's lawyer. Even if there's a civil trial, if Jack sues Mary for sexual assault, or, no, if Mary sues Jack for sexual assault, if Jack sues Mary for defamation, if Jack is fired from his company and sues his company for wrongful dismissal, we have rules of evidence, we have standards of proof for trying to figure out the true story of Jack and Mary. But a lot of the time, we can't access the law's procedures. Mary may not choose to go through a criminal trial, being a witness in a sexual assault case, even if you testify truthfully, is traumatic. Many people, even when they have done the things that Jack has done, will not be convicted in a criminal court because of how we establish it. Mary may not choose to go through that process, 
although she may choose to tell us her story because it's her story to tell, or someone else may tell it for her. We may hear her story, even if we don't have a criminal trial to rely on to figure out what happened. Even if there is a criminal trial, we structure those trials to make sure the state doesn't punish people wrongly. That means that while we can rely on a guilty verdict, an acquittal does not show us that a person is innocent. As those of you old enough to remember O.J. Simpson know, sometimes people are acquitted of crimes when they, in fact, did the thing they were accused of. So again, we may hear Mary's story. It may be brought to our attention. But that verdict of acquittal will not tell us whether or not we should believe her story and whether it's true and what's in that envelope. If there's a civil trial, we might get somewhat close to what's in that envelope. But civil cases don't go to court very often. They're much more likely to be settled. That settlement is likely to be confidential. And so again, we may hear Mary's story, we may hear Jack's response, and that civil trial or civil action won't tell us how to respond to it. So what do we do? Do we buy from Jack's company? Do we invest in it? Do we give Mary a job? How do we talk about Jack and Mary when we engage on social media? Now, the first thing to think about in relation to this is what's at stake. If we believe Jack, Mary is a liar, she's a manipulator, she's vindictive. If we believe Mary, Jack is a rapist, a rapist who will use a drug to get what he wants. If someone tells a story like that about you, even if it is true, it will be devastating. It will humiliate you, it will shame you, it might cost you your family, it might cost you your career, it will cost you your reputation. And that's if it's true. If it is false, it's much worse than that. It's a waking nightmare. It's what I would call an existential assault on your dignity if someone tells a story like that about you and it's untrue. So what do we do? I'm going to start by taking two possibilities off the table. The first is to say, well, I don't know what happened, so I'm not gonna decide. I wasn't there. The reason that possibility is unacceptable is because while it doesn't involve telling Mary that she's a liar, it erases her experience. It says that we can carry on and continue dealing with Jack, dealing with his company, and ignore the story that she's brought up to our attention, and that is an injustice to her. We also can't use a presumption. We can't use a presumption of innocence, but nor can we say, I believe all survivors. We can't use a presumption of innocence because, as I said, that's a way of testing the legitimacy of the states punishing you. It's not how we view or make decisions about each other in our day-to-day -day lives. If I'm deciding whether to go on a date with you, whether to go to dinner with you, whether to give you a job, I am not going to require proof beyond a reasonable doubt of your guilt before I have some hesitancy about doing that. We don't get a presumption of innocence in our day-to-day -day lives. At the same time, while it's true that very few allegations of rape are false, we also should not believe something as devastating as what Jack is alleged to have done simply because someone said that it occurred. We have to have more than that before we inflict that kind of harm on someone. We have to make sure that we have some reason to do so. So I'm taking we can't decide off the table. I'm taking presumptions off the table. But what I'm going to offer you instead are four commandments for making ethical judgments in the public square. The first of these, listen openly. Jack and Mary are people. They have a story to tell. And we need to listen to each of their stories openly in order to respect their dignity. We have to give them our attention and hear what they have to say. The second commandment, reason fairly. Be impartial. Seek out the best information from the most reliable sources. View that information critically and carefully. Be aware that your own experiences can be a helpful guide to how you understand a situation, but they can also distort your thinking. Know that like everybody, you're going to have implicit biases, you're going to employ stereotypes, and you need to be careful not to allow those to infect your judgment about what occurred. The third commandment, judge cautiously. 
you do not have access to that envelope. Frankly, even if you were a judge in a court, you don't have access to that envelope. Your information is incomplete. People's stories are subjective. So be very cautious in reaching a conclusion. And be prepared to change your mind as more information emerges. And finally, be careful in how you act. You've reached your judgment, you've tried your best to decide what occurred, but make sure that what you say about what happened is thoughtful, that it is nuanced, that it reflects the complexity of the situation. Try to create a dialogue, not a soundbite. Remember that it is always safer to defend the person you believe than to attack the person that you don't. And remember as well to see people complexly. None of us is the worst thing we have ever done. The possibility for atonement, for repentance, and for forgiveness should be available to us in the public square as well as in the legal system. At the end of the day, bad things do happen. They are brought to us for our attention and for our consideration. And it is on us to view people and these stories with complexity, with fairness, and with compassion. So the next time you hear a story like Jack's and Mary's, I would ask that you think about these ethical commandments and remember that it is less important to judge than to judge fairly and with compassion. Thank you.